Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, welcome you here this afternoon for an event hosted by our uh, BC Latino History and Heritage Committee. Uh, this afternoon, we have the pleasure of being host to Dr. Jose Gonzalez, who is the um, who works for the Providence School Department. He's currently the director of registration, and that, I guess, makes us kind of kindred spirits being, <laughs> being involved in registration here. <laughs> but his job is a little, a little, has a little different twist, though. They have a lot more people they have to register in Providence than we do at BCC. Um, Dr. Gonzalez's uh, expertise is in uh, issues in the higher education uh, his previous uh, position was the, uh, one of, the, of liaison to the uh, colleges and universities. He also has a background as a college administrator, uh, admissions officer, and his uh, dissertation uh, was based on persistence primarily in higher education for Latino students. So um, we hope to have a nice discussion this afternoon. Uh, which will be followed by questions and answers. And we hope that you uh, enjoy this and come away somewhat enlightened. So uh, without any further delay, I'd like to welcome Jose Gonzalez. Milton didn't mention that he and I were uh, students together at Rhode Island College not too long ago. And so uh, our history goes back um, um, to just about when I came from uh, New York City to, to Rhode Island and finished high school and, and found out that I could go to college. And that was a relief for my mother because I had a draft card and we were in the middle of a small skirmish called the Vietnam War. And so my older brother, um, who also is a good friend of Milton's and was going to co-present with me, um, he, he went off to college and I always knew that he was college material because he was the kind that even when he was eating cereal, he was reading the, the box and he knew everything about everything. So, But when I went to college, um, it was very unlikely for um, a lot of students who were minority, who were urban students, who were disadvantaged and had no means to go to college. But I was also very fortunate that during the civil rights era, there were a lot of people who struggled to make sure that youngsters like myself and Milton and my brother were, were able to have access to um, higher education. So being a product of the 60s, not Milton, he's a little bit younger than me, but um, coming from that era, I, I tell you that I didn't know that there was such a struggle um, in this country to create the opportunities for um, disadvantaged youth to go into higher education. And you know, I try to tell my children that because a lot of times there are parts of history that end up not being uh, pushed forward in the way that it should. And so my kids don't understand the struggles. And a lot of our kids in the school systems that we work with um, need to know the information about how it wasn't always a guarantee that students could uh, you know, do well in high school and then move on to college. Even some of the top performing students uh, found that they had to work, that they didn't have the money, that you know, some problem or, or um, issue um, came up and they had to defer their dreams of higher education. So when I got to the point where I was really like thinking, gosh, I could pursue a doctorate's degree, um, I did so because I thought that it was a good example for, for folks to know that a, a plain individual, not a scholar, not someone with an a extremely high IQ, someone that came from Central High School, not classical, which was the examination school, and it still is the examination school in Providence, but a person who went th through a large urban school system, who came from a background that originally, um, my family didn't speak English, we came from Puerto Rico. Um, I was born in New York City, but when I started kindergarten, I couldn't speak English. And um, so having all of that um, would have normally meant that um, I would not have had the opportunities that I did. So in writing a dissertation, I felt that I wanted to talk about Latino persistence because there are factors that have been studied by all kinds of researchers that help administrators and help the universities and students 
to realize that we can create the most successful experiences for students of all walks of life, from all different backgrounds. College, not only entrance, but actually completion of college is a, is a possibility for many of the students that don't even come to our doors. So in knowing that, in knowing that we can create uh, the, the types of institutional factors that create successful experiences, I wanted to study it at the University of Rhode Island in a program that accepted me many years ago that has continued to serve the uh, large urban and disadvantaged uh, populations in Rhode Island. Uh, and it produces the, the, the most tremendous results. Actually, the students that graduate from the University of Rhode Island Special Programs for Talent Development graduate at a much higher rate. They have a greater likelihood of succeeding. They go into a, a, a whole array of different kinds of programs and professions. There are folks that came from Central High School who are medical doctors, um, like my brother, who's a lawyer, teachers, nurses, you name it. We've been very successful because the university invested the right resources, support services, certainly financial aid and other things. And the students themselves realized that they owned a part of that mission as well. And I originally didn't know that when I came from Central and went to the university. I went because my brother told me there were a lot of girls there and they liked to party. <laughs> and that's not a... That's not a misnomer. The URI still has a reputation of doing that. But you know what? It took me a while. I did uh, you know, have a lot of academic problems because I did come from an, um, a large urban school district. I was also a, still an English language learner, and my vocabulary and writing skills were questionable at best. But by my junior year, I figured it all out. I found that I had to go to the library, not go buy it. I had to use and know how to do research rather than borrow other people's term papers. And so I started to liberate myself and, become, and became a good student. I started to want to know more, not felt forced to go to classes. I started to question um, uh, faculty, not in a threatening way, but just wanted to bring my perspective to the classroom and found that a lot of the faculty members welcomed and said, gee, I wish I had more folks like yourself yourself because you bring a different perspective to sociology, anthropology, even the history of English language. Because there were things that I could bring that you know I questioned or I didn't know or that other people just didn't ask. I felt that, well, I'm not stupid. I'm just going to ask these questions. And um, it, it really helped me. So when I pursued the doctorates, um, it was because I felt that you don't see too many Latinos with a doctorate's degree. And in Rhode Island, that's you know probably more so true than in a New York City or Dallas or, or Miami. So um, I felt that it was something that I needed to prove to myself that someone who is of average intelligence, who doesn't come from a private school education, can actually access and, and complete a doctoral program. It was my next step. And uh, you know, it took me seven years. Some of my friends went in, in, in and in three years finished their doctorates. I and mean, it was OK that I did it in seven because, you know, I was still figuring things out while other people were, I'll see you later, I got my dissertation approved. I'm like, oh my God, I'm still working on my questions. <laughs> yeah, so, but anyway, I'm, I'm very happy that I'm here and, and able to talk to you. The presentation that I'm going to talk to you about is something that I did not put together, but there is a consortium, there's a group of, of Latino professionals in Rhode Island, so a lot of this is Rhode Island specific, but it'll challenge you to find out more about um, the information in Fall River or in Massachusetts. There's some sources that will tell you Massachusetts-specific information. I just didn't have the time to look uh, specifically for Fall River or Massachusetts, but that's something that you might want to do. But there's a, a group of Latinos that we're all concerned about the way um, institutions and individuals, but institutions collectively representing individuals, are addressing the immigration issue and it's not because we are immigrants, because my family, being from Puerto Rico, I'm a US citizen. I was born, and it doesn't matter that I was born in New York or in Puerto Rico, I'm still a US citizen. So, you know, a lot of people can say, well, Jose, why don't you just walk away? I mean, what's your interest? You're a citizen. I said, because you know what? It's unfair. It's still a challenge in this society. There's a lot of challenges in this society, and this is one in particular. You know, I was a benefactor. I actually know that if it wasn't for 
the movement of the civil rights activists, the, the African Americans in particular, that were fighting and struggling to get um, access to um, resources, that I wouldn't be here talking. And now I'm looking at it, and there's still struggles. Um, but in the area of immigration, this is a problem that now crosses um, into the second century of, of ways of thinking that, to me, is very anti-American. So um, we're going to talk about that. And as a person who spent 17 years in higher education, I did six years in admissions, and you know, I ran all around the Northeast looking for students, and I, and I found students that I wish I could offer acceptance, but they didn't have a social security card, they didn't have a green card, and I'm wondering why if these students are the valedictorians, the top-notch students graduating from our high schools, and that's today as well as it was when I was a, an admissions officer in 1985, why are we not accepting these students? Why are students spending six, eight, ten years in public education only to reach what we could call a glass ceiling, because after they graduate from high school, there is no more education. And what does that do, not to the individual, their family, their community, but to the nation as well? And what are the implications when people actually condone that, they accept it, they feel like, well, that's the law, and they do nothing about it? So that's what the presentation um, should really examine. It's more general than that, but I want to open it up to questions and hopefully have answers, or at least you know, try to point us all in the right direction. So this talks about the problems with, you know, or the challenges with in, um, immigration today. But let's go back and look at the whole idea of, of the immigration problem. You know, I do a, um, uh, presentations on diversity, so I don't have this particular sl slide with me, but one of the first slides that I show is a sign that comes from uh, 1920, that, um, I'm sorry, 1914, where it says, uh, you know, there's jobs available, and then it, it, underneath it clearly says, Irish Catholics need not apply. So the reason I mention that is that the problem with immigration is not one that just started with the browning of America, with the, you know, the migration of uh, Mexicans and Central Americans, but it's been a problem for, for many, many years. And you see here that going back to 1924, you have a, a senator who is saying that, gee, aren't there enough folks here? Are we going to lose something in the mix when we have too many folks? And then he makes a comparison to uh, the immigrant population um, and the purity of our nation to that of a, of a dog, a, a, you know, an animal that might be a pure breed rather than a mongrel. Here's a uh, picture that um, came out of that same era. Um, you see Uncle Sam there with this worried look saying, oh my gosh, look at this. And these folks are not Mexican, by the way. You see some that uh, the flag there uh, on that one person's headband that's uh, really the Italian flag. So what they're looking at is that, you know, oh my gosh, we're getting a lot of uh, folks that are not really what this country would like to have. And that's, you know, the thought. And that's also what was um, sort of a, a brainwashing, if you would, um, to try to convince the American public that we didn't need so many different types of immigrants. You know, they, it certainly enjoyed um, immigrants that were Northern European, but you know, looking at Southern Europe at a certain point in time, looking at what was happening in California with uh, a lot of the Asian immigrants. You know, a lot of us have you know uh, memories of uh, of uh, reading the history books about Ellis Island. Now there was another island that was used for immigration in the uh, western part in California. Does anybody know what that island is called? No? See, that's part of the U.S. history that was sort of omitted. But there's an Angel Island, and that was more of a detention center and a point of return for many Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans who were um, not allowed to enter the country, although they had the financial background, they had family already established in the United States, they had everything that would normally allow an immigrant to come into this country, but there was an attitude that um, they were you know, there were too many of us, particular 
group of people, and so they were turned back around and sent back um, to their former homes. Um, there were a lot of folks that were involved in this whole idea of eugenics. And I remember that when we were going to college, there were some people, uh, a, a man by the name of Jensen, who was studying something similar to eugenics, was, you know, was looking at, um, in, in essence, the whole idea of intelligence and how you know, certain races, racial groups were innate, innately more intelligent than others. So we've been through um, uh, periods of history where there's a rise of this kind of philosophy, this mindset, that one way or the other, we're going to convince ourselves and others that there is a supreme group of people and that those are the folks that should be in control, those are the folks that should be in charge of resources, and also, let's not mix it up too well. Let's not create opportunities where folks can actually uh, um, have an impact on the offspring. So to, to me, to be American means all kinds of things. But for other people, there's an assumption that being American is that you're white. And that's unfortunately because you, tell, you ask a lot of children, um, and, and there are different ways that children are told about stereotypes. Sometimes it's right on television. Um, it's in their neighborhoods. It's, even in some of our books, we've gone through and tried to eliminate a lot of the racial, the racial uh, and stereotypical information. But nonetheless, children to this day, 2008, can actually tell you, you know, who they think is, is a smart person. They'll show you four pictures. And they'll more than likely pick a white male as who's the smart person out of these four pictures. And you say, well, why would they all pick a white male? So sometimes um, stuff like this that just keeps drifting from one generation onto the other and onto the other. But folks that did a lot of this um, uh, racial, uh, Im I'm sorry, immigrant bashing in those days are also people who were um, involved in um, what has now become hate groups, but you know, racially motivated groups in, in the early 1900s. Um, this person also was on the good side, was doing nice things like founding the Bronx Zoo, which was one of my favorites when I was living in New York. <coughs> so there was this whole fear that was being uh, promulgated by folks talking, not through research, there was no empirical data that they were using, it was just like, you have to be careful. You have to watch out. We're letting too many in. We have to close the doors. We can't allow that. Now, th again, folks like this were also looking at um, the black movement up towards the north. And folks were involved in the, um, the first race riots. I, I asked students um, in my high schools, um, you know, when you hear the term racial riots, race riots, who do you picture? And, and usually, because the most recent information is like uh, Los Angeles or something, you know, they picture and they'll say very, you know, like with no problems, you know, it's blacks, you know, running around throwing bricks at stores and stealing TVs and, and say, okay, when did the first recorded racial riots happen in the United States? And a lot of people say, well, you know, in the 60s, wasn't it? So, no, it was when right after the Civil War, when, when blacks started moving up to the north, there were towns that did not open up their arms. The north was not any better than the south, but you know, there were these whole images of how the north fought to free the blacks from slavery. But when the blacks moved up to the north, there were places like Albany, New York, Springfield, Illinois. There were so many northern cities that had racial riots, that had lynchings, that really burned families out and did all kinds of uh, devastating things. And folks that were involved in, in, on one frontier here with immigrants were more than likely on the other frontier. And that's why to this, um, two years ago, I read an article that was kind of unbelievable. I read that there are 6,000 hate groups in the United States. And I said, wow, that many. You know, it's kind of frightening because I, I, I want my children to know for that, for some unknown reason, someone out there hates them because their last name is Gonzalez, because they look a little bit different, whatever. And everybody in this room can have some hate group targeting you for whatever that reason is. And I think that that's one of the things that we sort of have to own in this country, that um, 
you know, with a lot of the liberties that come with, you know, um, being able to speak out openly, that the government and other watchdog organizations have to be very uh, vigilant of organizations that could easily cross the line and do things that are harmful to folks. Uh, in, in 1924, the Johnson Reed Act was trying again to contain the number of immigrants. Um, and this again was not uh, just Mexican, but certain types of immigrants coming from Asia, coming from Africa, coming from um, Southern uh, Europe. So they set quotas. Um, the funny thing is that the qu quotas that were set um, were really a lot lower than the numbers of folks that had already come from different countries. Um, first, border police. So this is where they first started to think, well, you know what? The problem is down in the south, the Texas-Mexico border. And they never looked at Canada. And to this day, a lot of people tell you it's a lot easier to come into the United States through the Canadian border. If you're interested in a really nice um, movie that shows you about that, uh, there's a, a video, uh, well, there's a movie right now called Frozen River, um, and it talks about how um, folks um, illegally cross into the United States through the um, Canadian border, um, and it, it crosses through um, Native American territory, um, and folks get paid to go and, and, and take um, immigrants through a very uh, difficult, uh, long and arduous you know, trail to get into upper New York State. So um, a lot of folks don't look at that. They think that the, our biggest problem is that we didn't build a big enough fence on the Texas-Mexico border. So this is a, a new person here that um, in, in 1982, with all the wealth that he had, was able to form not one, not two, but a good number of organizations that if you look at these names, you're like, well, this sounds like a real righteous group, but you're not. These groups are out there trying to collect whatever flimsy or fictitious types of information and create propaganda that really changes the minds of a lot of Americans into making you feel that we have to be careful of the immigrant population that there's problems associated with immigrants. Before it was filth and, you know, like um, criminal, and now it's, you know, diseases and, uh, oh, they're taking a lot of the employment and using up a lot of the state's resources. Um, a lot of people will tell you that they come here for welfare. It's really funny because I know many uh, individuals who came from mostly Latin America, but if you ask someone that's recently from Bolivia, as, as uh, example, and, so, and you ask them, what did, what did you ever know about welfare before you came to the United States? And they will normally tell you, absolutely nothing. I never heard of welfare. So how would we assume that people all wanted to enter this country to uh, find resources like welfare, food stamps, and other types of programs? So that's, you know, certainly not true, but a lot of times folks warn you about that, that they're going to tap into the resources. This person, uh, John Tanton, I never met, don't want to meet the person, but he's a puppeteer. He's controlling a lot of the state senators. He's got resources. He's, he's a very wealthy man, and so he's trying to feed them information, trying to get them to vote to build higher fences and to uh, limit the, the number of, of people coming into this country. And you know, even myself, I often wonder, well, what is a good number of immigrants coming into this country? How much can this country actually withstand? What is the actual impact? And um, you know, no one really knows unless we're able to get what we call empirical data, stuff that tells us actually what's happening in states like New York and Texas, California, Florida, that have now long histories of working with immigrant families in absorbing uh, immigrant families, and they can tell you the, what the financial impact is. Um, these folks here can continue to fund their, their own organizations and uh, look for ways to um, just give you stereotypical information. And a lot of this challenges 
the folks that work hard at making sure that we're not treating people in degrading and subhuman ways. And you know, um, recently you, you know that um, President Bush said that we weren't doing enough to you know, go after the, the immigrants who are here working illegally. And, and right here in Massachusetts, you know, they raided a, a company. And, and uh, unfortunately, some of the, um, the after effects um, was not well published. Um, so a lot of people don't know how many families were separated, how many children were not picked up from school and were left in daycares, and how far some of the um, undocumented um, uh, workers were, were sent just purposely to you know, do some sort of damage and, and do like a mental kind of thing to scare away a lot of folks. So the, the evening after that raid, um, a lot of families p packed up and left the area. And I think that, that, that was the effect. And it also sent a message to employers who were doing things um, in a way that the government said, look, if you're not doing the E-Verify, if you're not checking on Social Security, if you're not doing everything to eliminate the undocumented workers, we're going to go after you. And um, in Rhode Island this summer, the same thing happened, and it, w it affected our community college, our college and university system, because there were two subcontractors who were providing uh, cleaning services uh, for our university and state um, government um, buildings. And um, they uh, did a raid, and, and, and they took in basically a handful of undocumented. Um, but a lot of folks who heard about it quickly decided, well, I'm not going to work. And so it, it sort of um, flew back in the face of the folks that were contracting to work to the companies because for almost two entire months, uh, they have very limited cleaning services in our uh, state buildings in the college and the community college you know, said they did everything correctly, they put the job out for bid, the company got the lowest bid, and you know, they don't have to, with a contract, go out and do the verification. It was up to the company's owners. And that, one of the company owners now just admitted that he didn't use E-Verify, that's a fine, and that he didn't really check Social Security cards the way he should have, so that's another fine. So this, this gentleman is gonna end up um, going to prison, and a lot of the folks, that were caught cleaning our buildings, um, you know, were already uh, processed and deported, and some of them were separated from their families, and they left American-born children with other family members because they can't necessarily take their children back to a country that that child has no passport for. So it um, really was unfortunate when you actually see the, the entire effect of an immigration raid. A lot of the ICE agents say, you know, they don't, they're not in favor. They have their marching orders. They have to go out and do that. And they know that, you know, there's, there's moms who have newborn children and are expected home. Uh, they, you know, and, and they're separated from their children and sometimes sent. This is what really worries folks like my, my older brother who, you know, quickly tried to find out how he can, you know, find the locations of the people that were taken from this um, um, Massachusetts raid, and, and he found that even as a lawyer with years of experience in immigration law, that the government was unwilling to tell him. And the reason was that they were being uh, transported to places in, in New Jersey and Maryland and Midwest. Although we have uh, places here, detention centers in Central Falls that you could use, the idea was just to send them wherever. And I think that was pretty inhumane. Um, some of you know Pat Buchanan? So he's uh, warning us that we're going to lose the whole country, a country that was made up and has been made up of an immigrant experience, a country that welcomed the hungry, the tired, the poor, and whose contributions from all different nations really develop this country into what it is today, all of a sudden we stand to lose it. And I'm wondering to who. It sounds like the old days when we were told to be, be afraid of the communists because the communists were going to take over. And I said, well, that's from a country that only has two political parties. In other countries, because they, yeah, I've had the good fortune to travel. You know, I, I was in Italy and I realized there's 14 political parties in 
in Italy. And I said to myself, I wonder how the United States would do with 14 political parties. <laughs> but you know, over here, over here, you know, you're either a Democrat or a Republican. Here's another good picture. This is 1903. American ideas and institutions, again, created by you know, a host of folks who came from immigrant uh, backgrounds. You know, a lot of times, folks are told, you've got to be careful from, for the immigrants. They're not reminded that three or four generations ago, somebody came representing their family, and they're the offsprings of immigrant experiences. Even African Americans, you have to remind them that it was a forcible migration, but nonetheless, they came to this country. They didn't want to necessarily be here, but that was part of an immigration experience. And all the contributions that, that people have made to this country um, are washed away with the, the ideas that you know, it's, you know, the, the worst of the world is coming to uh, our country. And isn't that true if you remember um, in the 1980s when uh, Fidel Castro decided to um, open up his, uh, the doors of Cuba and some of the institutions as well and say, okay, if you Cubans are not happy in Cuba, go ahead. So there was the whole Mariel experience. And if you've not uh, witnessed that, there's a couple of good books and there's some videos. But um, a lot of people thought that that was going to lead to the demise of the state of Florida because everybody headed to Miami. And you stop and think, have any of you been to Miami? It's a very productive, yes, it's like any urban city has some issues, there's some problems and challenges, but it's a very productive city. You know, there's a lot of employment there. And um, it was able to absorb the Mariels quite well. What is the largest immigrant population in the city of Boston? What, what country do you think the illegal, the undocumented immigrants who live mo in, in Boston, what is the largest group represented there? Are they Mexican? They're Irish. Yeah. And you go into the Cape and the Vineyard and other areas, you'll see that there's you know, underground newspapers and all kinds of support systems. But Boston has absorbed the undocumented quite well. And you, don't, you actually tell you, they warn you, don't touch these folks. They're our kin. Of course, you know, if you meet somebody and they share the same last name or they have a, you know, uh, an experience that you can relate to because your great grandmother told you about it, you're going to feel offended if somebody's trying to, you know, track them down, chase them down, and deport them. It's harder for you to identify with a, uh, a Guatemalan family, for example. But in Boston, you know, they do their best to find employment, housing, all the resources, and those folks are not welfare. Those folks are not looking for food stamps. They're all trying to become part of the mainstream, and it's quite difficult. So back in the beginning of the century, you know, there was some concern about the Russians. And by the way, many of the Russians were Jewish. So there was some religious issues there as well. The Italians, the hung Hungarian, and other groups that just didn't seem to make the cut. So the, the trend is, and again, that was the question I had. Well, what, I, I, I can't tell you for sure what's too many. You know, what's the, the limit in this country? So we know the country has grown. Half of the growth has been through childbirth. But the other half has been uh, due to the immigrant population. And the fact that the immigrant population is also a, a very young population, there's information that tells us, well, you know what? These folks are coming. They're coming with children, or they're having children. And uh, as the American mainstream population gets older, <laughs> We have to stop and think about who's the workforce? What kind of workforce do we need in this country? And are we shooting ourselves in the foot by turning away or limiting the, the number of immigrants coming into this country if a lot of our industries are saying they can't find folks to take certain kinds of jobs? Now, this is probably the worst time to be talking about the availability of jobs because we're going through um, um, a, an economic challenge right now. But nonetheless, we have to look at um, how immigrants have always been a part of the American workforce. 
And it's a funny thing that the, the, the problem that the new immigration laws have had is in essence, it's basically backfired on a very natural process. So before the, um, the southern, the southwestern states became part of the United States, they were really an extension of Latin America, Central America, parts of Mexico and families flowed up and down easily. And they were migrant workers, so they knew to head towards California uh, to find work. And then when the work was, when the harvest was done, they went back down and lived in Mexico until you know the next season, and then they moved up. And if there was work in Texas or in, in Arkansas or somewhere, they would go up that way. And we even had that here in the United States. We had migrant, I'm sorry, in New England, we had migrant workers that came to the Cape to, you know. Um, work on uh, different farms and, and even in, up into New Hampshire. But if you go to the Southwest, that's where you feel. But by closing up the, the, um, the border and, and controlling and making things so tight, a lot of the families that would normally head back down after the harvest felt compelled to stay and to hide. And they weren't going back um, to their homeland as, as frequently or regularly as they had always done for uh, generations. Families have been moving around, following uh, farm work, mostly. There's a, a great uh, video. Uh, the name of it is A Day Without a Mexican. And I would suggest that if you like to, to uh, a little bit of humor, but look at something in a way that shows you what we don't always think about. Look at this, watch this movie, A Day Without a Mexican. And it talks about the crumbling of the infrastructure um, in the state of California when a fog one, one day mysteriously rolls in and every immigrant in the state of California disappears. And every service and every type of um, um, activity that we were used to gets challenged because the infrastructure is not there anymore. And that's why I was saying that uh, I, I, we had a a series of professional developments for our teachers at the community college. And they kept telling us, these buildings are horrible. They're dirty. I said, well, they, <laughs> they got rid of all the immigrants who were willing to do the work. What do you want? These buildings are now, you know, no one's cleaning these buildings. Uh, so let's continue. OK, now I'm going to go to just give you some idea of, of Rhode Island. And you know that the Providence area and Fall River, you're, we're close, you know, there's a lot of things that families go back and forth. I can tell you in the province school department, I have children who will spend two, three months here, will go to Providence, things don't look good there, they might go out to Central Falls, they'll go to Lowell, Lawrence, and if things are really horrible, they'll fly back to Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic, and, and then maybe they'll come back next year. And so there's a, a sort of an interconnectedness between the cities and towns, but just to give you an idea, um, Providence, and I'll, t I'll talk as, a, as an educator, our school district right now has 24,000 children, and 59% uh, of those children are Latinos, but they're not undocumented, and they're not all immigrants. A lot of those Latino children were born in the United States. A good number of them are from Puerto Rican families, so they're not, um, they're U.S. citizens, and then, you know, there's no issue with their um, status, although I tend to think that a lot of people look at Latinos and they think we're all undocumented. Uh, I know that uh, I went to the Burlington Coat Factory the other day with my wife and I had the most embarrassing situation happen and it proved to my wife, because my wife thinks I'm paranoid, that you know people see something and, and there's projections, but I was using a credit card and, and the woman gave me a hard time, asked me for a license, she called an assistant manager. I'm like, what is the problem? And my wife, who was also buying on credit card, was the next customer, and I was so irritated. Finally, I bought my pair of pants, you know, and I'm like, I can't understand this, you know, maybe store security. And when it got to my wife, who is obviously um, American in, in appearance, the, the lady changed her demeanor, you know, like, hi, credit card, sure, zip, okay, see you later. And I said, hey, you didn't check her ID, did you? And she's like, she, I thought she was going to call sec stork security, so I said, let me get out of here. So I said to my wife, you see what I mean? Why did they card me, you know, hit me with all this, checking the, you know, my signature on the back of the credit card, calling for an assistant manager? 
And with you, it was like, no, no problem. Do they think that I'm an undocumented immigrant or that, you know, maybe I'm not American? And I had a suit and tie on and I speak English well, you know, it's not like, I didn't ask for an interpreter. <laughs> So my wife says, I, maybe you're right, Jose. I said, I think so. Something's up. So um, in Rhode Island, we have about 32,000 people um, in two, two districts that um, have grown considerably. Again, when I went to Central High School, there were about six of us who graduated in the year 71. And now you go to Central High School, and the Latino population is probably at 75%, although the district's about 60%, that one particular high school is, is overwhelmingly Latino from every country in Latin America, Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean. We also have you know, students that come from um, a host of different countries. I, I do believe that we have 80 countries represented in Providence and about 45 languages spoken. And you know, for some of my colleagues, that's a challenge. It's a, oh, more ESL programs, we got to, oh gee, what are we going to do? We got to get interpreters. Uh, the parents don't show up, they don't understand. For me, I look at it, these are the assets. This is our future, and we want people who speak more than just English, who understand different cultures, who can work with different uh, companies and promote things and do things on an international basis. But we got to watch out with this whole uh, I, um, concept of assimilating into American culture because a lot of our folks think they have to abandon their native language. So what good is it if we have a lot of diversity but then people are sort of um, uh, told or indirectly feel that they have to abandon their culture and their language. So how many of our second and third generation Latinos actually still speak Spanish and know a lot of the cultural tidbits that have to do with Latin America, um, and even Spain and Africa, and all of the, the makings of the Mayas, the Aztecs, the Incas. That's wonderful stuff, you know, it's very helpful. I know that the private sector is always looking for, for diversity. They want people who represent different cultures, and they, they do because they know that that, that uh, serves their business well. So in Rhode Island, the year 2006, <laughs> It's 117,000. Puerto Ricans, we're uh, part of the, the population of Latinos, but we're kind of different because of the citizenship thing. As I mentioned, very young group, median age, 23. We're in the rest of the state, folks are 38. 90% of the uh, folks who are uh, listed as Hispanics in, in Rhode Island are under the age of 50. And about one quarter, and this is you know, the best information that we can collect, um, is probably undocumented. So if that's true in Providence, then I would say if you were to get information about Fall River area, you probably have something very similar. In, in Fall River, it may be that they're not all Hispanics, but there may be um, Brazilians, you may have Cape Verdeans, you may have other groups that don't necessarily live in the Providence area. Um, I was in Manchester, New Hampshire, and they had a whole host of different um, uh, immigrants who have come from different African nations, European nations, that we don't see in Providence. So sometimes you go to Detroit, you have more people who are, are coming up from Arabic nations. And so there's you know, this ways that families attract each other, there's communities and colonies, and. Folks that came, let's say, in the 1970s when we were receiving Vietnamese, Cambodian, Hmong, Laotian families, a lot of those families are no longer in Providence because someone decided to go you know, to California, to Texas, to Minnesota. We have a very large Hmong population in uh, Minnesota. So folks don't stay still necessarily. Um, the Latinos in, in Providence, we have a good number of children um, unfortunately, uh, quite a few of those uh, families are living in poverty. And that's a challenge for school systems, it's a challenge for the health and human service providers, um, the median family income, so that you don't think that they're all, you know, uh, getting welfare and selling drugs on the side and doing all this, they're highly successful. A lot of these folks are living, they're working poor. They're, 
maintaining employment, but they're paying high rents and they can't afford health insurance and other kinds of issues. Home ownership is, is quite low at 28%. One of the things that I wanted to, again, I think I've mentioned this already, but a lot of our children are U.S. citizens. The problem is even though they're born in the United States, if they're born to undocumented parents, the parents get caught, they get deported, the children have to leave. There's no rights as a child who is a U.S. citizen, like the rights that you as uh, American U.S. citizens have. These children, although they're born in this country as well, don't have the rights because it, it's based on who their parents are and whether or not they are documented. Now, one important fact that uh, I wish my brother was, was here, he'd tell you that 70% of undocumented residents are in the process of becoming legal, 70%. They've started, they've initiated processes that can take up to 14 years. The shortest amount of time for a person to become a permanent residence permanent resident through a family or a marriage um, is six years now. And there's quotas. So if you're from the Dominican Republic, it may not work out for you because those numbers have been dwindled down. It's a lot less. And the, the problem again is that this, um, we go back to a segregated uh, system where certain sections of Providence, and I'm not sure if, if in Fall River you can say, this neighborhood is almost all Latino. I can say that in Providence. You can go to Oneyville, and it's almost 90% Latino. You can go to the south side of Providence, and between Latinos and African Americans, it's 100% there. And other uh, things that tell you that folks are being steered towards certain neighborhoods that they can only afford that you know, landlords are willing to sort of turn their back and say, you know, you can double up with your sister-in-law and that's okay. So this uh, segregation is up, it's on the increase. And that challenges us in the school district because a lot of times we're talking to parents about neighborhood schools, but guess what? If a certain neighborhood in Providence is almost predominantly white and not enough blacks and Latinos are going there, the Office of Civil Rights is gonna say, why? Why is this a segregated school? And then we're going to have to do some forced busing, and that brings me back to the 70s and 80s, and the problem with forced busing is that a lot of black and Latino children will be bused, but a lot of white families don't like to have their children bused. I don't blame them. Busing is not the answer, but um, you know, it's, it's trying to keep our neighborhoods from being segregated. Now, Latinos also really do a lot for the economy, and a lot of times that's things that um, you know, the, the hate groups don't want to talk about. They, they want to talk about how they drain the economy. But you know, Latinos not only send a lot of money back to their native lands to support their families, um, and, and you can check with uh, Western Union and all these other companies, they'll tell you their business is thriving because every Friday Juanito comes and he's sending mama $50. Actually, when it gets there, it's only like $32, <laughs> but he's sending money home because mama wouldn't be able to survive without that. So that's part of the economy that you know, people don't talk about. Also, if you go down Broad Street in Providence, and probably a street here in Fall River, Milton was gonna take me to a Dominican restaurant, so I can just imagine that there's gonna be stores where before everything was closed up and businesses, businesses had left, because you know what, you can get it all at the mall, but now these Latino families are, are creating opportunities because those stores in essence, are connected to other services and employment and then home ownership and steadiness of families so that we can educate the children and they're not moving around, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of businesses whose receipts, you know, end up being in the high millions of dollars. That was 1992. Oh, this is the remit remittances that um, um, from Rhode Island to Latin America. It's so a lot of money being sent out there to Mexico, Central America, South America. I want to continue so I can get the, uh, a chance to, to talk to folks. Oh, we're kind of done here. All right. <laughs> wow, that was fast. Um, 
Okay, Spanish is being, repla uh, being replaced by the, the language of the households in most families. English is seen more. So grandchildren are having a hard time. And, and I think of my kids when I take them to my mom's house. My mom speaks to them in Spanish, and they're like, what she say, Dad? <laughs> I said, well, you know Spanish. Come on. Most immigrants want to be U.S. citizens. They don't want services. They want to be able to work and provide for themselves. So we attract immigrants. Rhode Island was always a very comfortable place. I think this part of Massachusetts was for a while seen as a welcome center for, for immigrants. There weren't that many ICE agents out there looking for your, you while you were working in a factory and trying to separate you from your families and take you away from your children. After you spent two, three years trying to get into this country, that is so devastating. All right. There's no data that supports that um, immigrants are on welfare. That's, um, you know, really one of the uh, biggest fallacies. And without proper education and health costs uh, associated with helping immigrants, imagine they don't have the services that we normally need. Um, that's, that is a danger. And people who are hiding out from the government don't feel they can go to an emergency room. Okay, so I think this is the last one. Oops. So there's contributions, again, by immigrants, especially those who have Social Security cards that are not theirs. They're taxed, but they never, at the end of the year, submit their tax return forms. So the, they say that the Social Security system really relies every year, you know, several billion dollars are being generated through fo folks who can't get their uh, rebates like we do. OK, I'm going to leave it here. Um, Texas alone, you know, says that they'd be in the hole if it weren't for the immigrants. And that's the kind of information that we should really be looking at, the kind of information that tells us, you know what, if undocumented students are graduating from Fall River High Schools and are not coming to BCC, then what are they doing for the economy, for their families, for themselves, for the state? I mean, this is a community college. In Rhode Island, what we do, we charge them out-of-state tuition, which is three times in-state tuition. So you could have graduated from Central High School. Last year, the valedictorian from Mount Pleasant High School, eloquent speaker, um, and not a Latina, but uh, an undocumented um, immigrant said, as you move on to college, just think of me, because I have not been able to get into a college. Now, Brown University, other colleges have been able to completely uh, offer complete scholarship without the use of federal funds. And that's what most colleges need to do, is to find ways to help families so send their children who prepared for the college experience, who graduated. They did everything that they were told to do, and now the doors are being closed, either through finance or the politics. So that's it. I'll take some questions. I know that some of you have to leave, and I'm not offended. I'm sorry that I took so long. I actually took about 12 slides. <laughs> it's probably an hour and a half, two-hour presentation. Questions? Yep. Yes, and we have a, a, a group of professionals looking at the different states, uh, California, Ohio. Um, right now, Texas had a plan, and they had to rescind it. They first and tried to get the state universities to only charge in-state tuition, and that's, that's very important. Others are trying to set aside separate monies that will help provide the scholarship dollars to uh, send them through. So right now, yes, there's several states working on it. We're trying to get the Attorney General in the state of Rhode Island to give us an opinion as to whether or not it's legal to charge a student who graduated from a Rhode Island high school who spent the last five or six years in Rhode Island in out-of-state tuition. We think it's illegal to do that because technically that kid grew up in Rhode Island. But they're saying on the other side is that they don't they have not maintained legal residence in the state of Rhode Island. So we're going to challenge that and see in Rhode Island. But other states have already uh, moved forward. And that helps us in Rhode Island when we bring the information um, to the decision makers. But it is a politically charged um, agenda. As many of us that would like to see this happen, there's a lot that oppose it. In Rhode Island, there's a couple of senators um, and reps that have always been against it. And they will continue to be so against it until we move them out. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, you touched upon uh, what an integral part, you know, um, immigrants have in the workforce. And um, of course, the ideal that's taught to young American students is that America 
is supposed to be the land of opportunity. Uh, people are supposed to be able to come and get their um, citizenship, like you said. Uh, most immigrants come from some other part of the land. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest um, solutions brought up among politicians today and Congress is um, amnesty for, for for undocumented community. Do you think that that is the only solution to um, what really is a large population of undocumented people that it's very hard to collect together and say, hey, everybody, let, let's get our papers together now. Let's get make sure you can get your citizenship. Mm -hmm. Do you think that would be the only solution? Not the only. I think it's part of it. Um, with amnesty, the problem is that we're admitting that, hey, this family's been here eight years, <laughs> and we're going to give them citizenship. You know, they've been living here on illegally. They should have never came here. They should have never been allowed to uh, use our resources to send their kids to public schools, et cetera, et cetera. We did an amnesty program. It really worked well. And those people that were fortunate enough are, are grateful because now they've become permanent residents. They have a chance to become U.S. citizens if they so des desire. They can actually go back home and visit relatives who are sick or, or, or dying and not worry about coming back. So I think that does help the current group of people who have been here for the number of years that they, they, they'll put as a requirement. But I think in, in, that's only part of the solution. The other part is looking at our workforce, our needs, and creating the opportunities for people to come more freely. Just like the, 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 uh, the free trade agreement, I think we have to have an agreement with workforce that people can actually get working cards and come. And if they so desire to stay here, put in a request that is realistically going to be processed and not like in a 14-year time frame. And you're expected to, you know, do what in that time? So I think that there's a, a combination of things that have to happen. But am amnesty is good for those families that have been here. They've not been breaking laws. They've been, you know, productive members of our society, with the only exception that they got here illegally. Is that it? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez.